Good afternoon, everyone. It's three o'clock. It's time for Tree School Online. I'm Glenn Ahrens, OSU Extension Forester for Clackamas, Marion, and Hood River Counties. It's my pleasure to be your host for today's Tree School Online webinar. Tree School Online is a production of the OSU Forestry and Natural Resources Extension Program and the Partnership for Forestry Education. We want to give special recognition and thanks to the Oregon Forest Resources Institute for leading this project and to the U.S. Forest Service and Oregon Department of Forestry uh, for providing some grant funds to cover expenses. Tree School Online webinars are continuing the first and third Tuesday of each month. We're going through June of this year, uh, 2021, and then we'll take a bit of a break and we'll be starting up again next year, although we do have high hopes for an in-person tree school in 2022. So stay tuned for that, um, not only in Clackamas, but around the state. Please visit the Tree School Online page um, on the knowyourforest.org website for updates on these. So I have some housekeeping uh, details. Uh, the Zoom toolbar should be located at the bottom of your screen. If you don't see it, scroll your cursor over that area should pop up. And on some machines, it'll be um, on top of your display. Uh, many features can be accessed from the toolbar. Your audio as participants is muted unless unmuted by the host. In general, we're going to use the um, chat and the Q&A. Uh, video is not available for uh, participants. Uh, we want you to put your questions in the Q&A box. So those are written questions go in the Q&A box. And I'll be monitoring this and uh, running the Q&A sessions with our speaker today. We're asking that all those questions go there and that you use the the chat box for some of the, any kind of technical issues about Zoom or other observations that aren't questions for our speaker. We have resources for this and other classes. Um, you can find that in the Tree School Online uh, class guide. And that page can be reached from the Tree School Online page on Know Your Forest. And you can also just go through our extension site to find the Tree School Online class guide. And you click on the webinar description and you'll see some resources in a drop down menu. Um, you can access those. Uh, also, um, if you're looking for continuing education credits for the Oregon Pro Logger or through Associated Oregon Loggers or the OSU Master Gardener Program, uh, we have a, a process for that and a form. It's also to be found in the resources. We're recording these webinars and they'll be archived as YouTube videos accessible from the Tree School online pages. And we'll also be using polls during the session, uh, one at the beginning and at the end. And it should pop up on your screen in a box and you have an opportunity to vote on the poll. Um, and that's the way we can learn uh, more about you as the audience. So with that, uh, I just want to introduce our speaker today, um, Glenn Howe, uh, a longtime uh, colleague of mine in College of Forestry. He's an associate professor in the Department of Forest Ecosystems and Society at Oregon State University. Uh, he's the director of the Pacific Northwest Tree Improvement Research Cooperative. And he also teaches uh, forest biology, uh, normally an in-person class, and adapting forest to climate change uh, via eCampus. Uh, Glenn's research focuses on forest genetics, tree genomics, tree breeding, and the effects of climate change on forests. So of course, that's why we have you here today, Glenn. If you could go ahead and uh, turn on your video and your, your microphone, and I'll let you introduce your show a bit before we do the first poll. Okay, I think you might still need to provide access to my video. Oh, you well, you should be there. Let me let me check. Oh, I see that. Okay, there you go. Okay, there we go. Um, well, thank you, Glenn, um, uh, and thanks for everybody joining the uh, webinar here. I think it's a um, very fascinating and important topic, so I appreciate all the interest in it. Uh, has, um, okay. You might have to wake your PowerPoint up. Yeah, I might have to do that. Um, there we go. Okay, well, thanks again. Um, so this is an overview of what I'm gonna talk about today. Um, I'm gonna start out by talking about just a tiny bit about climate change, you know, as the foundation for the topic. Um, a little bit about what we expect in relation to forests. 
Uh, but the most, uh, most of my talk will focus on species distributions and the distribution of genetic variation in tree species. So I'll first talk about species distributions and talk uh, conceptually at first. So talk about why do trees live where they do and then eventually what that means to us in relation to climate change. And in particular, I want to talk a little bit about how um, species uh, distributions might change in relation to climate change. And then all of that is kind of building towards the end in which I want to um, provide some tools and some other resources that one might use for considering climate change during reforestation. So that's kind of where, the, um, where it becomes most relevant, I think, in terms of the specifics uh, that you're probably interested in. All right, so Glenn, first, I'm gonna I'm gonna break in and we'll do our introductory poll before we get okay, started. Okay, sorry. So sorry to interrupt. Sorry. But, uh, yeah. So we do want to find out a bit about our attendees and for your benefit, Glenn, to see where folks are coming from. Um, okay. So I'm gonna go ahead and share the poll here. And that button is hidden. Here we go. So you all should see a poll. Um, if you would, just go ahead and answer the questions. Uh, first question is, uh, where are you from? Um, next question is, are you a woodland owner or a natural resource professional uh, or other? And if you are uh, an owner, then do you, how many acres of land do you manage? And these usually just take about a minute and, and those who participate will do so. And then I will show the results and you can see that, Glenn. Coming in quick, we usually top out around 80 or 90% participation. All right, I think we're there, last chance. Okay, I'm gonna end the polling. Right, here we go. And I will share the results. So it looks like about 62% of us from the Willamette Valley area, and then the rest kind of around the state, coastal Oregon, Southwest Oregon, a couple from Eastern Oregon and uh, from Washington State, USA, and one uh, international participant from outside the USA. And then amongst uh, you all, um, woodland owners are a little less than half. Uh, natural resource professionals add up to a, a good uh, third or so and then other, another 30%. And of folks who own land, um, about two thirds of folks own land and 10 acres less uh, is actually uh, the most common, but it's pretty well distributed all the way up to uh, over a thousand acres. Uh, so that's, that's your audience, Glenn. And so now I'll, I'll turn you loose for your presentation. Thanks everybody. Okay, so for those who uh, might have stepped in late, I'll um, go over the uh, outline for today's talk then again. Um, again, I'll first talk about climate change and what we expect in terms of effects on forests. I'll focus on species distributions and why trees live where they do. Uh, then combine those two topics and talking about how species distributions might change in the future. Most of that will be pretty uh, conceptual in nature, kind of getting everybody on the same page and then that's all leading towards uh, talking about some uh, tools uh, for um, helping consider climate change during reforestation. So um, climate change. So obviously climate change um, is with us and we're gonna have expected fast effects on forests. So we wanna talk a little bit about what those are, but um, as an introductory level, I just wanna emphasize the fact of the, of the difference between weather and climate. So when I talk about climate today, I'm mostly gonna be talking about um, the general conditions of the atmosphere over a long period. And particularly we use a period of about 30 years and what are kind of the average conditions during that time. And that's in contrast to weather where we typically think about the conditions of the atmosphere over a shorter period of time, such as hours or days or weeks. And here we have a nice little cartoon here kind of emphasizing those distinctions. So as we talk about um, climate today, I just wanted to make sure that we're all understanding that we're talking about the conditions over a fairly long period of time. So um, forests uh, we are, are experiencing threats and are, ex are expected to continue to experience threats into the future. 
you know, these come from direct changes in climate, such as many cases, warmer temperatures, changes in precipitation. And these also then lead to certain abiotic stressors or the stressors, stressors on trees and other, uh, other plants and animals, for example. So we have summer heat and drought stresses, um, maybe not as uh, obvious to people that warmer winters can be a problem for forest trees. Um, again, and then these kind of changes can also lead to changes in disturbances, insects and disease outbreaks, obviously fire, wildfires, which uh, all of you in this part of the country are well aware of, but then also other things such as windstorms and extreme events, which are particularly problematic in the southeastern United States and other places uh, throughout the United States. And then what we can think about then in terms of how these things might affect forests uh, overall is that we can potentially see losses in productivity, um, perhaps even losses in, in certain ecosystems. And then what I'm gonna be focusing on today is potential shifts in species distributions. So again, I wanna emphasize that this is potentially a one slice of the uh, various ways that climate change may affect forests. So again, primary impacts of forests, we can think about changes in reproduction, survival and growth, disturbances, and again, our, today our focus is on species distributions and forest composition, and then what we might do and how we get the information needed to account for those potential changes when we think about uh, particularly reforestation. So first I wanna introduce uh, some concepts and some topics talking about species distributions and why do trees live where they do? And so, you know, very broadly speaking, we can look at the, um, the, the earth or the globe and we can see that different species have different tolerance limits for environmental, that is uh, what we consider both the abiotic and biotic aspects of the environment upon, upon, beyond which individuals cannot survive, grow and reproduce. And this isn't a particularly important concept because when we talk about species distributions and characterizing natural species distributions, um, we, we need to think about to inhabit a particular location, species might, must not only be able to survive and grow, but it also must be able to reproduce. And so that's an important thing that many people perhaps aren't directly thinking about, particularly if you're thinking about artificial reforestation, for example. But this figure here then shows how the distribution of tree, uh, tree species varies across the globe. And one of the main or main, major factors that influences where species exist along the globe is climate, as we'll talk about. And so then uh, what I wanna talk about here is to introduce a few terms that people may have heard about, but maybe not be entirely familiar with in terms of um, this particular topic. The first is what we talk about as the range, the broad geographic area occupied by a species. And that's represented here by this broad gray area uh, shown below here. So this might represent a particular species range. But within that area, we have what we talk about as the species distribution. And this is the areas actually occupied by a species. So within a broad range, we may know that a certain species may inhabit north facing slopes, but not south facing slopes, for example. And those kinds of distinctions would be characterized uh, in the species distribution. And then particularly important um, when we talk about trying to infer species distributions is the concept of habitat. And so that is not necessarily a particular location, but it's the set of environments. And again, that can be the biotic or abiotic environments in which a species normally lives um, and survives, grows, and reproduces. And we talk, typically think about some of the most important habitat characteristics as being temperature, moisture, but also soils and even competitors um, of, from other species. So this shows a, uh, an example just to kind of um, emphasize these particular concepts. So this is some, uh, I'm, I'm showing here some two contrasting species in terms of habitat. Um, western hemlock and a juniper. And this upper picture here then shows the broad geographic ranges of these two species. They're kind of contrasting, uh, particularly uh, they both occupy areas up in British Columbia um, quite a bit. Uh, and then these lower figures then show the distributions again, the more detailed locations of these species within these broad geographic ranges. And then finally, I wanna talk about habitat here. And these two, um, what, we can think about these as kind of environmental spaces um, in terms of habitat. 
So along one axis, we have the soil um, nutrient regime from very poor to very rich. And then we have the um, moisture regime from wet to very dry. Um, and so we can see that these two species then occupy different habitats within, these, within which we call this environmental space. So Western hemlock then inhabits areas that are wetter and actually somewhat poor in soils, whereas uh, this juniper typically inhabits areas that are particularly drier at the upper end of this uh, rectangle and towards uh, this area in terms of the uh, soil nutrient regime. So when we think about habitats, one way to characterize those is in terms of these kind of what we think of as environmental spaces and in more particular um, in the, in the Later in this lecture, we can talk about climate spaces. So tree distributions that are then associated with climate, and that's the first thing we want to um, talk about here. Uh, and so what, this is just shown um, a figure of a, of a tree species you're probably most of you are not familiar with, but it's uh, one that demonstrates that we can have an environmental gradient. In this case, the example is temperature from low temperatures to high temperatures. And then we have a tolerance limits within which the species can occur. And we have some optimal um, uh, environmental conditions. And then as, as we get towards the extremes of the environmental conditions in either direction, in this case, we see that the populations may be stressed. They may occur at lower densities, um, for example. And again, these are the kind of conditions in which um, the species are typically able to survive, grow, and reproduce. Um, the kind of relationship between climate and then geography is kind of nicely demonstrated in this uh, cross section of a, a mountain range in Utah showing typical Utah vegetation zones. And what we have on this side here, we have the elevation along this mountain uh, transect, elevation in feet. Um, over on this side, we have meters, but it also shows how the um, environmental characteristics tend to change as we go up in elevation in most parts um, of the world. So we have dry areas, typically at lower elevations in Utah, moist areas in mid elevations, and then more uh, wet areas at the higher elevations. And then we see by these little pictures nicely demonstrate the kind of characteristic vegetation types that we would see um, that are associated with geography, in this case elevation, but also climate, which is associated with those geographical uh, changes or differences. So then this kind of summarizes conceptually again what we think about as a habitat. It can consist of the abiotic components, such as those, as I already mentioned, but again, we also need to remember that it also encompasses the biotic component, the animals and other uh, types of plants and other microorganisms that are found associated with uh, the trees that we may be interested in. And so one of the key things here then is that if climate changes and particularly some of these key habitat characteristics change, then it's likely that the habitat will change and species will no longer be able to survive, grow and reproduce in the same ways they have historically. But we also need to remember that climate also affects um, the animals and vegetation. So we have a complex interaction um, between climate and the habitat that involves interactions directly and indirectly via the effects of climate on other animals and vegetation that interact with the trees that may be a primary interest in this case. So it becomes quite complex then to infer the effects of climate change on uh, species distributions, but we do the best we can to try to figure out um, what is likely to happen in the future. So again, what this slide then um, emphasizes, we can think about where our forests found, and this emphasizes that the very important role of temperature and precipitation. So in generally, if we look across the globe, and these might be thought of as kind of major biomes across the globe, forests are found in zones with enough water and a correct balance between temperature and precipitation. So if we look along this axis here, we see mean annual, temp mean annual precipitation ranging from lower values to higher values. So this is the drier part of the spectrum. And then we have that um, with mean annual temperature. In this case, you want to realize that this, um, this axis is reversed from what we typically might think of it in terms of the colder temperatures being at the top and the warmer temperatures at the bottom. And again, like we saw for those um, habitats 
shown for Western hemlock and juniper earlier, we can think of this as an environmental space. And we see that um, forest trees um, uh, exist within a certain um, area of that environmental space defined by a certain range of precipitation and a certain range of mean annual temperatures. So very often when we think about the distributions of species and, and habitats, we typically think very um, quickly about the roles of temperature and precipitation. And what this shows here is some, some data um, that is uh, from species that we're familiar with in the Pacific Northwest. So along this axis here, again, we have um, temperature going from lower values to higher values. And then we have the density of that tree species. And again, remember that when we think about um, species relationships to habitat, we have a kind of distribution where species are more dense versus where they're less dense and perhaps more stressed. So what we see here is that along the temperature gradient, we see that Douglas fir typically occupies um, warmer areas and lodgepole pine, for example, typically occupies colder areas. So lodgepole pine, as many of you know, would typically be found at the higher elevations um, associated with colder temperatures uh, in, this, in this region. And then if we jump down to look at precipitation, we can see that um, these species have slightly different um, habitat characteristics for precipitation as well. So in this case, then we have hemlock um, typically is found at the wetter areas of the spectrum. And then Douglas fir then, again, this purplish color here is found at the, um, at the drier end of, of the spectrum compared to um, hemlock. And so we see that these species occupy different parts of the habitat or different characteristics of the habitat um, for temperature and precipitation. And so those kinds of, uh, for example, temperature and precipitation then in some, in some fashion then helps us, um, well, is associated with the distributions of different species. And then those, uh, that kind of information can be used to infer where species occur. And so this is a nice, um, this is kind of a simplistic way of looking um, again, similarly to that um, mountain transect I saw for Utah, we see different kind of vegetations associated with different elevations, primarily because these different elevations are associated with different temperatures and precipitation regimes. And so that what happens if we have some degree of climate change, you know, one of the uh, simple effects we see, but not, not necessarily always, is that many of these vegetation types the habitats themselves would tend to migrate up in elevation. So that is one potential effect of climate change. If we look at some of the projected changes in the Pacific Northwest, um, we can see um, here um, is some examples. And what I'm noting here is the simulated, these are modeled uh, scenarios, modeled climate scenarios, different potential climate futures. And this shows the modeled, um, distribution of different forest types. So we see a particular contraction of subalpine forest shown by this uh, turquoise color among these different climate change scenarios. And then we also see an expansion of the temperate evergreen needle leaf forest. And so this uh, shown by the green here. And so this is one potential future for habitats in the Pacific Northwest. And so one of the points I wanted to emphasize here is that when we talk about climate change, we cannot think about a single correct answer, but we can think about a range of possible scenarios or a range of possible futures. And so this is just kind of emphasizing again that subalpine forests are projected to decrease in the Pacific Northwest. This shows a couple of examples of subalpine forests in the Northwest. And that um, we also expect changes um, in the maritime climates um, uh, in terms of perhaps becoming more temperate um, as, as, uh, as climate changes again in the Pacific Northwest. And so this shows two examples of current um, types of forests that are found here um, that are likely to change their distributions or the habitats for these forests are likely to change in the future. So then one of the things we want to talk about is, okay, if the habitats are going to change due to climate change, can species migrate fast enough to, to keep pace with climate change? And so the first thing I want to emphasize is that we can, uh, uh, changes in distribution of tree species have occurred over very long periods of time. So this goes back to about 21,000 um, years. 
And then this shows the distribution of some spruce species based on um, macro fossils um, from um, pack rat middens and also some pollen analyses. The pollen analyses uh, figures here show it best, but we see a generally northern um, distribution or change in the distribution of, of, of spruce over this particular period of time. This is a long period of time, however, and so we can use data uh, such as these kinds of studies to kind of infer what is the kind of minimum um, uh, migration uh, speed of forest trees. Now, again, there's a certain uncertainty associated with these kinds of data because species may not migrate as a kind of um, organized wave, but they may migrate from refugia that have occurred in these different areas. So this adds some uncertainty into projections of how fast species can migrate. We also need to think about how species actually migrate. They can migrate from seed, vegetative populules, pollen, um, but then also species can migrate um, via the actions of people. And so later on, we'll talk about using assisted migration to facilitate the migration of species. Another way that we can infer tree migration is to measure or conduct forest inventory analyses at two different times. And if we do that, we can see that perhaps we have some trees that are dying or some species that are dying, measure percent mortality. And we may also see some ingrowth, the appearance of new species in particular areas. And then using these kinds of inventory data, we can see, we can use those data to kind of infer whether species are migrating as well. So for example, if we have an environmental gradient, um, this might be a temperature gradient from south to north. Um, if we see the distribution of seedlings in these inventory plots across the landscape that is farther along that environmental gradient than the distribution of mature trees, we would infer then that species are perhaps migrating in a northward um, direction or to um, what have been historically colder climates. So we can also use current kind of inventory data to infer species migrations. Um, what this figure shows then is what is the speed of temperature change between each of these different biomes? So how fast would species need to migrate to keep pace with climate change? And so you can look over these in terms of the um, hard copy availability of this, these slides. But what I pulled out here then is three examples of forestry species. And based on these kinds of analyses, these analyses suggest that temper conifers would have to migrate about 110 meters per year up to about 350 meters per year for temperate broadleaf tree species. Um, this is the rate of climate change. So species would have to migrate at that speed to keep pace with climate change. Here's an example using uh, uh, information such as those um, inventory data that I mentioned earlier, looking at um, a combination of different kinds of studies. And this is simply asking the question, do species seem to be keeping pace with climate change or not? And if you look across this table, we see that um, where data are available, um, that only a relatively small portion of tree species seem to be keeping pace with climate change based on these kind of inventory type analyses. So based on the pollen information that I presented earlier, um, some of the molecular analyses that I did not discuss, the migration rates of climate change per se, these numbers tend to not add up and makes us concerned then that species themselves are unlikely to be able to migrate at the pace of climate change. And so then um, we, we also know from genetic studies and the like that individual trees are unlikely to be able to evolve quickly enough in place and then if species are unable to migrate at sufficiently low speed, uh, sufficiently um, fast enough, then we have concerns about the health and perhaps viability of, of many tree populations. So that's kind of an introduction uh, to uh, where species occur and why they occur there. Um, and I guess, uh, Glenn, we might take one or a couple questions at this point. Okay, let's see if there's any questions. Uh, you know, there are no open questions at this point. I think uh, you just set the foundation. Um, okay. I, I have a question, actually. You, you were talking about post-glacial rates uh, in one of the slides. If, and it looked like there was some fairly rapid migration in that post-glacial period. Um, 
uh, you know, I guess, what, what, what do you mean by change. rapid migration? What, well, I just you your um, slide said something about post glacial migration rates that seemed like they were not that far off from the observed migration rates we're seeing now, like right. Years, okay, so that's true. Years. So that, you know, some of those data suggest that. Um, species can migrate at perhaps you know a thousand meters per year or so, which I guess many people would consider rapid. Um, whereas some of the the pace of climate change currently would probably be less than that. And so this does those kind of things are not you know orders of not not always or or not consistently orders of magnitude different from one another. So that leads to some ambiguity about whether species will be able to migrate fast enough or not. It's likely that some probably will be able to migrate fast enough, but others probably will not. Okay. Yeah, it did seem like they were not that far off. That some of them. No, no, they're, they're not that far off. That's right. Yeah. Um, there's a question here. Um, the concept of climate refugia is that appropriate in tree terms uh, for that function to prevent local extinctions? Yes, uh, yes, it could. So climate, a climate uh, refugium then would be an area that due to particular maybe topographic characteristics and other characteristics tend, would tend to retain its current climate longer than uh, areas around it, which may change more rapidly. And so that these could potentially provide areas where species could pers persist for longer periods of time. Um, but then the question is that many people are concerned about all the areas outside of those refugia. And it's also uncertain as to the, um, the impacts of climate change on those refugia themselves. So it's, un it's uncertain that, you know, to what extent those will persist over the long term. So it certainly plays a role, but if we're interested in species across the entire landscape, then um, the presence of climate refugia may help uh, preserve uh, the, may, may act in a way for gene conservation and maybe species conservation, um, but will be probably limited availability to um, prevent, you know, wide scale issues outside of those refugia. Okay, yeah, I could envision a climate refugia like a uh, cold air pocket in a mountain valley and um, where the temperature increases are, are much less dramatic. Uh, so you might see species persisting, but only in the bottom, and then the right. whole mountainside would become inhospitable. Right, and those climate refugia may be very suitable for some species, but obviously some species would need, you know, quite a large areas to maintain the populations and maintain the, you know, um, genetic diversity and other kinds of things that would be important for long-term persistence. Okay, another question. Uh, climate is changing more rapidly in a higher latitude, isn't it? Uh, is the distance per year faster in Alaska, for example? Yes, and that previous slide I showed, if you go back to that, it looked at the climate, uh, the change in climates for different forest biomes. So they actually broke that down into not just kind of like, let's say latitudinal differences, but they actually went through and tried to characterize the rate of climate change um, associated with different uh, biomes, including forest tree biomes. So if you go back to that other slide and study that, that's kind of what that's getting at, that climate change is not uniform. Yeah, I know we went to, uh... Fairbanks, Alaska, and we're looking at uh, more than three times the rate of recent change that they'd observed there and, and really okay. dramatic effects uh, compared to what we saw in Oregon. Uh, another question, can you compare the rate populations would need to migrate upslope uh, in elevation uh, to that for migrating north? Uh, is that, I mean, that transfer, uh, what kind of altitudinal distance uh, and rate of change? Yeah, so um, I would say I have not seen very good very good data on that. You know, the, the issue there is that um, has to do with the type of data available to assess that. Now, people have been looking at that, particularly in Northern California, but people have been looking at um, rates of change upslope, and in some cases, uh, species change downslope. So I don't know that we have very robust data to um, estimate those rates uh, currently. And even, in fact, these latitudinal rate changes are have wide uh, bars of uncertainty associated with them. All right, well, this is not exactly a question, it's more of a, a humorous uh, observation. Uh, uh, quoting, uh, these roots are made for walking, but they <laughs> need to be running. Okay. Just um, an observation someone had about this. Uh, well, topic. maybe if they provide their name, I can cite them when I use that in my next presentation. Uh, okay, well, uh, yeah, it's uh, so, someone named Josie. <laughs> 
Okay. Well, good. I'll, I'll try to say Josie next time. That's a, that's a really, that's a good line. Thank you, Josie. All right. Uh, no more questions right now. Um, Josie says she'll email you or email, I'm not sure, but um, you'll hear from them. Okay. Well, okay. Um, I think we can move on and uh, there'll be another Q&A break shortly. Yeah, okay, great. So then, um, so obviously a lot of, a lot of the things uh, that people have been looking at in terms of potential species, uh, changes in species distributions or habitats anyway, um, makes us then ask closely, uh, you know, what can we do about it as forest managers? And I, I just, this slide I'm just using here, there's many kind of stand management options that are available. Um, I typically think of these as being kind of stopgap measures, things that we can do with current stands to help them better with stand stresses. Um, but what I'm going to be talking about today are the reforestation options. So these are not the only options. We have other kinds of options available to us, but it's one of the ones that I've been focusing on and one of the things I think is going to be most effective. Uh, so um, species distributions um, are likely to change, and hopefully I made that case in the first part of this talk. Um, this just shows a potential um, change in the distribution in the habitat of white spruce um, in British Columbia um, from, this was a few years ago, but from what was then current uh, climate into the climate of the 2080s. So we're likely to see these kinds of changes, and uh, white spruce is a good one in terms of projected changes northward, um, primarily related to temperature. Now, the one thing I wanna emphasize here and try to keep this in mind in the rest of the talk is that when we talk about changes in distribution, we're really talking about habitats. So these, is, these represent the areas where the species is likely to be able to survive, grow and reproduce, but it really doesn't tell us much of anything about whether the species will actually be located there because to be located there, it needs to get there in some fashion. And that's the kind of the very uncertain part of things. So remember when I talk about species distributions, I'm really talking about habitats and where species could survive and grow and reproduce, but not necessarily areas where they will occur. And so the very simple thing we can think about here, this is um, some um, information about the distribution of uh, Douglas fir. Again, uh, this was a few years ago, but this would have been current about 2012 and then projected distributions in the future. And so the very simple thing we can think about doing then in terms of reforestation is not planting near the margins of the species and particularly um, areas where that species is unlikely to occur in the future. And so that's one of the things I'm gonna be coming up and showing some information in a little bit. Those are the kind of areas we wanna to try to identify so people can consider whether it's really makes sense to plant those kind of species in those locations in the future. And so this gets to, um, what we talk about is assisted migration, um, which I, I use the term assisted migration. Other terms are used as shown here, but generally that's the intentional movement of species, populations or genotypes out of their known historical distributions in response to anticipated climate change. So we're trying to predict the future and do something about it. The other thing I wanna emphasize from this slide is that typically people think about species assisted migration, moving a species outside of its current uh, distribution or range, but we also need to think about, it's very important to consider this at the population level, and we're gonna be kind of drilling that point home um, in a little while. So how do we project where species can occur in the future? And so what I'm gonna focus on is one method for doing that. And I think it's you know, a fairly effective way, one of the probably the best tools available to us. And that's a use of the so-called species distribution models, or we can have many other names that you might've heard about that are associated with the same kind of concept. Um, bioclimatic models, climate envelope models, et cetera. But again, I want to emphasize here that when we talk about distribution, we're talking about the distribution of habitats and not necessarily the species themselves. So we come back to um, this picture here, and I'm going to use a cartoon picture of the same kind of concept in the next slide. So again, if climate changes, we might likely see um, upward or upslope movement of particular vegetation types. So now let's use that kind of uh, model in our head of a of a, um, a transect or a mountain. And I wanna just talk conceptually about how we infer where species will exist in the future. 
So we have a mountain here, and let's say we've done some forest inventory and we've characterized where a particular species occurs currently. And so it occurs primarily in this green area here. It's not so much located in these other vegetation types shown by these different colors. And so then what we do is we do some analyses in which we find out the climatic characteristics, for example, of this green area. And then we use information from climate models, uh, both global climate models, regional climate models, um, to find out where this particular set of climates is likely to occur in the future. And then this would be our projection of where that species habitat is likely to occur in the future. So we have occurrence records here. These are the various steps that we'd be taking, environmental variables, primarily climate. We develop a current model of the current species distribution. We find out how well that model works. We project that model into the future to find out where that habitat may occur in the future. Here's a little bit more uh, less cartoony way of showing that. This shows uh, point locations uh, for a particular species. We get the predictor variables. In this case, uh, the predictor variable being precipitation, mean annual temperature, um, distance to water, which can affect the local climate. And then we develop a mathematical model that gives us um, a relationship between species suitability and these various predictors. And then we can use this model, we can change the input predictors to future climate variables, et cetera, to come up uh, with a model of where that species may, uh, where that habitat for the species may be suitable um, in the future. And that is shown down here. So it's kind of a mathematical approach that involves modeling. Um, there's many different kinds of approaches that have been used. Um, there are kinds that I'm focusing on here all based on the same fundamental concept though. Now, in terms of models, again, I, I have a lot of people who eventually ask me very specific questions about the currents of species, but these models are models. And so there's very, uh, quite a few caveats associated with them, which keeps us from being able to provide very precise information on species locations in the future. And you can look over this again in the PDF copy of the slides. I'm not going to go through all these potential problems in this approach. But I want to demonstrate that with this slide here. And so in this case, someone did a species distribution model of Sasquatch, um, taking Sasquatch observations, um, relating that to climate variables. And so this is the projected range of Sasquatch. And then um, the, uh, the person who did that then happened to compare it to the um, projected range of black bear and found quite a, quite a good correspondence. So this is just kind of a, a kind of a nice demonstration about um, the kind of limitations to kind of these models and, and input uh, input uh, data versus output data and um, the caveats that one must keep in mind when evaluating these climate change models. So then um, the next part I want to talk about is um, how might we consider climate change and I want to talk about a set of tools that we've developed. Um, to allow people to better consider climate change when they're, um, for, exa for example, considering artificial reforestation. So the first of these tools um, that uh, were developed by uh, colleagues of mine and myself is called the Species Potential Habitat Tool, um, developed with, uh, in collaboration with people um, from the Forest Service, OSU, and the Conservation Biology Institute. Um, again, I emphasize the fact that this is a potential habitat tool. Um, sometimes we use species distributions um, as a synonym for that, but this, the name of this tool emphasizes that we're looking at potential habitat and not the um, actual distribution of the species necessarily. So what is the um, species potential habitat tool? It's a GIS mapping tool and it can help force managers match species. So this is kind of considering um, species uh, choice, perhaps species assisted migration with planting sites based on climate information. And you can, um, I hope everybody doesn't do this currently because we can sometimes overload the website, but at some point you might wanna take a look at that and see how this tool works. Um, this tool again is based on um, modeled species distributions um, currently, 
Um, we have data in this tool for these uh, range of tree species, and we're um, hoping to be adding more um, in the future. Uh, this happens to show um, one of the outputs from uh, Sitka spruce showing potential um, increases in habitat for Sitka spruce due to climate change. But what one does when they use this tool, they can select a species. So again, I mentioned this one here shows Sitka spruce. I'll show some other examples in the future. And then one of the things that you can do then is you can examine the modeled species distributions for different time periods. So what this shows is um, using this kind of climate period from 1961 to 1990, so a 30 year period, again, represent climate, not weather, um, shows um, where uh, Sitka spruce habitat might, might, might occur. And then we also can um, uh, compare that to um, various kinds of um, future climate scenarios. And so I'm not going to go into these climate scenarios in detail, but Climate projections can involve various assumptions about um, human population growth, uh, technology, and essentially future atmospheric greenhouse gas concentrations. But we can also look into the future. So I'm mostly going to be focusing on um, the time frame in terms of the system scenarios that I'll provide some examples for. And then this tool allows you to download as PDF copies um, pictures such as these maps here. So what do some of these uh, what does some of these data from this particular tool look like? So this is a, a modeled species distribution for Douglas fir. And so this would be using um, climate data from 1961 to 1990. So this would be the model distribution in that time period. It's going to be very similar today. And then what we can do is we can um, use that model then and use as inputs um, projected future climate data and see where their habit, where that habitat, what that habitat looks like and where it's distributed. So here's, um, this is for a period of approximately uh, 2025 then. Um, and so we have a particular um, legend here. The yellow areas show where habitat is projected to be lost. Um, the green area shows areas where that habitat is projected to remain. Um, and then the bluish areas tend to be areas where habitat is projected to um, be gained for this particular species. And so you'll see then if we compare it to the um, current distribution, we tend to see habitat um, projections of habitat being lost more on the east side of the Cascade Range. Then we can look a little bit farther out into the future and we see that those areas, um, uh, those yellow areas increase in amount and we start to see a little more area down in this part in addition to the um, areas on the east side of the Cascades. And then we can look out even a little bit further and we see this kind of trending increase in habitat being lost for Douglas fir as we look into the future averaged over a couple of a number of different climate scenarios. We can also, using this tool, um, look at a consensus. So if we look at three different time points, three different climate normal periods, a couple different climate scenarios, we can have a broader range uh, in the legend from habitat um, lost to habitat gained. And this information then has the number of scenarios associated with those different kinds of um, uh, projections. And so it builds in a little bit in terms of various degrees of confidence in whether that habitat will be lost, remain the same in the green, or perhaps um, being uh, habitat being gained by these blue areas. So that's kind of an example for Douglas fir. Um, then in contrast, let's take a look at what we see for ponderosa pine. So here's the model distribution of ponderosa pine. Um, again, this is um, what we would expect currently. And then if we look a little bit out into the future, again, we see some yellow areas again along the east side um, of the Cascade Range. And then one of the points I want to make here, since uh, many people are familiar with these kind of areas, is look a little bit at the potential for habitat being gained in, um, in this area here. So this would be, uh, you know, towards Northern California, Southern Oregon, for example. And if we look a little bit further out into the future, we see a little bit more of that blue area in, in this part of the area of the re region that I just mentioned. And again, uh, some increasing 
uh, yellow areas along the margins of its range um, on the east side of Cascades. And then finally, if we look out even a little bit more into the future, we see um, other changes in, in ponderosa pine. So potentially, particularly if ones, let's say, um, located in southern Oregon, one might use this information to perhaps begin thinking about transitioning from planting Douglas fir on particular sites to planting ponderosa pine would be one of the potential outcomes of using these kinds of data. And then this is again um, showing that uh, consensus map, three time periods, two climate scenarios for ponderosa pine, showing a broader range of potential um, habitats um, being lost or gained and including some of that information that provides some degree of, of confidence for these different projections. Okay, so I can uh, maybe take a, a few questions at this point again, before we wrap up with um, seed source, consideration of seed sources and within species or population level migration. All right, we do have some questions. Um, first one is how do large scale forest fires affect distribution or maybe you know setting things back? Okay, that's, uh, that's a really tough question. So. I tend to think of forest fires as, as having two, two particular effects. One is the kind of stochastic effect or things that are unexpected effects that perhaps we're seeing currently. The other one is um, the kind of effects over long-term effects of fires on the occurrence of particular ecosystems. So um, again, we're dealing with uh, climate modeling, uh, species distributions based on climate that kind of approach does not take in directly projected changes in wildfire. It potentially takes into projected changes in wildfire only indirectly as those, uh, as those wildfire areas or the vegetation associated with more or less frequent wildfires are captured by the species distributions themselves. Right, yeah, so the Willamette Valley was home to great oak woodlands but in the absence of fire you get more Douglas fir, but if fire burn more often, then you know it would eliminate maybe who could live there, even right. if the, even if the climate is right. Right. So, could you tell more about assisted gene flow or assisted colonization? Um, not sure exactly what that means, but um, you might be able to interpret that as a geneticist. Yeah. So, um, assisted gene flow. If we're, so, again, I highlighted earlier that we can think about assisted migration. Um, being practiced on the species level. Um, so for example, we can think about planting a species uh, in an area where it has not historically occurred. And so we can think about many people are interested in planting giant sequoia or redwood in areas in Oregon and Washington, for example. That would be an example of species level assisted migration. Um, uh, assist, some people might call that assisted colonization because you're moving a species into a new area. In, a, in the next part of the talk, I'm going to talk about population level assisted migration, which may be what that um, question refers to in terms of um, a gene flow. Yeah, and I mean, guess what do you think about the non-native tree species role in uh, mitigation of climate change? Um, I think it's going to be very important because, um, you know, the the information that I see from many different directions so suggests that many of these forest ecosystems are not gonna be very healthy in the future or, um, or persist in, in some cases. And so uh, use of exotic tree species, exotic by being planted you know, anywhere outside of its current range or distribution um, you know, is almost inevitable to, if you wanna maintain forest function in some fashion. A uh, quick one here, does the species potential habitat tool include models for understory species? No, no, it doesn't. Um, uh, that's all something that is, uh, uh, you know, possible through um, using uh, FIA data in which those species have been measured. That becomes fairly uh, doable, um, but it, it's a fair amount of work. And so the, the people that are kind of focusing on this work are kind of working through kind of the major tree species first. Um, although some people have taken on individual, um, uh, you know, non-major tree species uh, in different uh, as, as kind of special projects, but. Um, I think that's a very good point that it would be great to do all of that and include all the kind of species that we're interested in in a tool such as this, but um, uh, we need a little more funding to be able to do that. 
Yeah, so you're working your way through them. And there was another question about, you know, what other species you plan to map. Um, yeah, so you are going through the list of- kind Yeah, of so I mean, basically um, you can think, uh, work is being done on uh, 40 or 50 uh, tree species in the Pacific Northwest. You, you know, you can take your list of uh, any, anybody's list of kind of uh, important tree species and rank them in the Pacific Northwest. And you can kind of pretty much come up with a, with a projected plan for incorporating new species information um, available um, to people in Pacific Northwest. You can also look at the, um, the, uh, the, the tree atlas, um, you know, uh, by the, that's um, a similar kind of tool um, that's available for Eastern tree species, which has, you know, a much larger number of tree species in it than we have now. Um, that's more of a static tool rather than a, um, a dynamic tool as we have though, however. So it has some uh, more species, but um, different kind of delivery of that information. Yep. Um, how do you use these maps to estimate when to start planting it in new habitats? Um, I don't know. That's a, I think that's a good question for the, the people attending this. There's a lot of uh, debate about um, how to use this kind of information. So obviously, most trees that are planted will be on the, on the landscape for many years. Um, and so um, depending on the pace of climate change, uh, a species may be well adapted at the seedling stage, but not so well adapted at the mature tree stage, um, and vice versa. The, the species may not be very well adapted at the seedling stage. Um, how, do you, uh, how do you reforest and get um, successful regeneration of the species if you're targeting that species to be well adapted to some future climate at the end of a rotation, for example? Um, so I think there's a, a lot of judgment that goes into this. This is... Um, we know that the current habitats are not likely to stay the same. We know that they're changing. Um, we need to incorporate that information, but there's a lot of uh, just kind of um, empirical knowledge uh, and um, expert knowledge that's needed to use this information in conjunction with a lot of other normal kinds of information that we use to make reforestation decisions. Yeah, I think we'll get into this more when you talk about the seed lot selection tool, but the key question yeah. is, you know, on the ground, how do we start trying to do this? <laughs> That's yeah. where, and, uh, and when and how much? And, um, is there also modeling for climate mitigation effects uh, in this? And uh, I think that's inherent in the different scenarios. Uh, there, there's no um, there's no direct consideration of climate mitigation. So there's other um, you know scientists, particularly you know colleagues of mine and other people I know that really are focused on the carbon cycle and and the productivity of tree species um, that that is more closely associated with the use of forest management and forests to mitigate climate change via carbon sequestration. Um, this kind of informs that to a certain extent. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it's, there's other people that focus more on that particular topic. Well, but some of the scenarios you have, you, there are some that are more conservative about future greenhouse gases and others that assume that, That's that right. it goes to a much higher level. One of the, one of the main um, connections between this work and carbon sequestration, for example, is that, um, it, you know, in case there are some cases in which projections of uh, forest growth and carbon sequestration do not account necessarily for the full effects of climate change and the maladaptation of forests that's likely to occur. And so that, that absolutely needs to be incorporated into projections of uh, forest biomass, forest growth, and, and carbon sequestration. Um, and so this kind of is a little bit of a red flag about needing to do that and, and to being as accurate as you can about the future health of the forest when projecting uh, ability of those forests to sequester carbon. Yeah, and here's a, a, a question or observation that, you know, is it even possible to model plant community types rather than species, which gets at more of the, the habitat the yes, area. yeah, so that, that can be, I didn't mention that, but that is certainly done. And so there's been quite a bit of work um, very similar, very conceptually similar in modeling, um, you know, habitat types or, or you know, communities um, along the same lines, and particularly up in British Columbia, um, using their, their biogeoclimatic, you know, um, system for ecological classification in British Columbia, those have been also modeled uh, relation to climate change. So you can see the projected changes in those ecosystems over time using very similar approaches.
Um, well, I'm not sure if you want to stop now and go back to the presentation. There's a few more questions, but maybe we'll take those at the end. Okay, that sounds great. Okay, we'll get to you. Okay, so I'm making a huge assumption here that you, you feel comfortable in choosing a suitable species um, for uh, planting now and, 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 and planning for it to be healthy um, over its rotation. Um, so then the next important question you have to ask yourself is what seed source should I use? And um, this figure on the right of this slide is one of my favorite ones for demonstrating the importance of what we call seed source variation. Um, we might call it population variation or provenance variation. Um, and so this figure shows an aerial shot then, uh, pre-drones of a lodgepole pine provenance test growing in New Zealand. And so what they've done here is that they've collected seed throughout the range of lodgepole pine planted in this plantation in New Zealand. And you see absolutely dramatic differences among the different seed sources of lodgepole pine and how they perform here. So if you were using lodgepole pine as an exotic species in, in New Zealand and you planted this seed source, you would um, be very happy with yourself. And if you planted this seed source, you might have, might have lost your job. Um, so this is a, um, a great example of seed source variation. And so the, the, the thing is, is that um, I previously showed distributions of Douglas fir, but within those distributions of Douglas fir, we have very important um, differences among those populations of Douglas fir that more or less make them more or less adapted to the um, local climates in which they inhabit. This shows another example. This is for Douglas fir in a provenance test, a similar kind of situation uh, of a test growing in Spain. And then this also shows uh, some lodgepole pine uh, winter damage of lodgepole pine provenances uh, compared to others that have done um, very well um, in Finland. So we also need to consider, uh, we can't just use any seed source of ponderosa pine if we wanna begin um, perhaps transitioning to like ponderosa pine, for example. And the whole concept of uh, managing within population genetic variation is known to probably most of the people on this webinar. Um, and it's been managed uh, by the use of seed zones, for example, um, since about the mid 1960s and then um, at various times, these kind of guidelines or seed sources, uh, seed zones have been updated um, over time to reflect new knowledge. And so again, a seed zone then is an area, it's a defined area um, on the landscape, typically defined by uh, a geographic, a continuous geographic area and by elevation in which um, guidelines suggest that you can collect seed within that particular seed zone and plant it back into that anywhere within that seed zone and have expected good performance of the resulting plantations. So um, we've also developed another tool called the seed lot selection tool, which is aimed at providing guidance on uh, which um, seed sources to use um, for uh, reforestation of a particular species. So it's, it looks very similar, has very, uh, very common um, uh, similarity to the um, species potential habitat tool. It, it's also a, a GIS mapping tool that helps manage, uh, forest managers match, match seed lots with planting sites. And again, you can check it out at that web address. Um, this shows some output um, and uh, again, emphasize it developed by the same uh, consortium of, of myself and colleagues from the Forest Service OSU and the Conservation Biology Institute. Now, when we think about um, considering seed sources and planting sites, we can think about it from two perspectives. So I just want to emphasize, and we've, we've called these objectives. So your, might, your objective, let's say you're a silviculturist, your objective might, might be that I have a planting site and I want to find seed that is suitable for, for that planting site. Alternatively, you might be a seed orchard manager and you are, have a seed lot and you want to sell seed to people in the Pacific Northwest. And so you might be interested in finding suitable planting sites for a collection of seed or a seed lot. And so these can be thought of as two um, almost converse ways of looking at the relationship between climates and particularly current and future climates. So you need to think about uh, what is your major objective in, um, in matching? Are you trying to find a planting site or trying to find a seed source? 
This kind of uh, gives an overall scheme about how this tool works. You select one of these two objectives I just mentioned. You can pick a location. Again, you can choose various kinds of climate scenarios um, based uh, on um, time into the future and um, different kinds of projections of lesser or greater climate change. Um, and then there's some other um, options here that I won't go into a lot of detail, but you also need to uh, provide some information on what climate variables you want to consider and how far you think it is safe to move um, seed sources in relation to particular climate variables. And that uh, guidance on that is kind of available in some of the instructions available um, on this website. So again, we choose uh, an objective and I'm gonna show an example here. So in this example, we're looking for um, seed, um, let's say a natural uh, seed, seed from a natural stand um, to plant on this planting spot shown by this um, blue pointer there. So we have a planting site um, we can select climate scenarios. In this case, we're only looking for matches based on the current climate. And we're gonna use, uh, for this example, we're gonna use mean annual temperature and mean annual precipitation as a way to decide whether a particular seed lot is close enough climatically to plant on this site or not. And so we see these areas here, the darker orange areas are a better match, and then the lighter um, orange or yellow areas are not as good a match. Um, but still probably acceptable. And so what we see here, we see that at this planting site, we obviously see that seed, seed sources um, from around that planting site are deemed suitable, but we also see some areas that are climatically similar, fairly far away that might be considered um, for also getting seed that might be suitable for this planting site. But then again, one of the major impetus for developing this tool is to look at the potential effects of climate change. So again, if we look a little bit into the future based on a particular um, climate scenario, we see um, those areas shifting, okay? So if I look, we can look up here and if we look into the future again. So the question we're asking here is that where would I find seed that would be optimally adapted to this site in the future year of 2025? And what we see then again, um, not too surprisingly, is that the areas that are suitable tend to be slightly more southerly, slightly farther down in elevation, i.e. they're coming from warmer areas currently because we expect this planting site to be slightly warmer than it is now in 2025. We can also look a little bit farther into the future and we see again those areas becoming um, less common and again moving a little bit more towards the coast and again a little bit farther um, uh, more southerly. And then finally, if we look out to uh, 2085, in this area here, we only see this little spot down here that would be doomed, uh, we would be deemed the climate match um, between this particular seed source here and the climate at this planting site in this future year of 2085. And so I've just um, uh, zoomed out again then to show um, some of the other areas, you know, particularly, uh, you know, farther down, farther south would, would the seed sources be um, suitable um, for this planting site. Now, again, this is based on a certain set of assumptions in terms of um, how much climate change there's going to be and based on what climate variables are important and how far I can move things in terms of mean annual temperature and mean annual precipitation. So we have uh, you know, reasonable guidelines for these kinds of decisions. But again, there's a fair degree of uncertainty in making these kinds of projections. Okay, so then what I wanna do is, is um, begin wrapping up by talking about a new tool we're developing. And I'm just gonna drop back here um, a couple slides to um, using the CLAT selection tool this gives a very nice geographical representation of where suitable seed lots or seed sources might occur. Um, but, and I think it's a very good educational tool. It's a good scoping out tool. But the next question then is comes, well, where do I get this seed? Where, where, where is this location? How do I find seed associated with this on the market, for example? And so <clears throat> we've addressed that by developing this uh, newer tool called the Zone Matcher. And it's based on tying these kinds of projections directly to seed zones 
and breeding zones and deployment zones that people are currently using. And so here's an example. Um, what this does, rather than having a kind of, kind of continuous output as in the seed lot selection tool, the question then is, if I have <clears throat> a planting site, or if I have a seed lot from a named seed zone, then um, what this tool allows you to do is find other seed zones or other zones in the region that are a climatic match. And so rather than being a continuous kind of output, it's rather discrete in terms of these different kinds of zones. So we might find other zones that are current climate match. So for example, if I had a planting site in this seed zone and I was unable to find seed from that seed zone, I could easily use this tool to find other named seed lots that would be suitable for planting there based on a climate match. And then again, we can also use this for considering future climates um, by finding climate matches between zones currently and zones in the future. So again, we can also incorporate consideration of climate change into this. This particular tool was developed um, for this particular region here. And one, it includes British Columbia, includes Idaho and Montana and California. So one of the major goals of this project was to provide a link between the various um, seed zone or zone systems available in the Pacific Northwest. So BC has their own system. Idaho and Montana has their own system. California has their own system. Um, Oregon and Washington have a system that's fairly similar to one another. But um, this now allows you then, if you have a planting site in Oregon, you could easily then look for seed from other parts of the region um, and easily find name seed zone or seed lots um, for your planting site. So this, um, this tool is, is, um, is still slightly under development. I provided a link there so you could take a look at it, maybe provide us with some feedback about features that you'd like to see. Um, but we expect to have this um, advertised and up and running uh, sometime in the summer, probably by midsummer. It's not, um, it's not a GI, it's not a GIS based or um, map based um, application. So it provides everything in kind of a tabular form, um, but it's very good for using it large scale and for using it with named uh, seed zones, for example. And so I'm just gonna go through this real briefly. Uh, in this case, we have a focal zone. And so this might be an area in which we have a planting site and we can, we can enter a named zone. So this is a Washington 66 seed zone. It has a zone unit of 11 and it falls within the elevation range of zero to about 500 feet. And so if we have this zone, we can use this application then to search all other matching zones in the region um, for zones that have a climate match. And those are listed here. And we see quite a few, um, well, these all shown on this screen are all Oregon, Washington uh, seed zones. But if you were to scroll down here um, or look at the full output, you begin seeing zones in California and Idaho and Montana showing up as potential matches for this particular entry zone. Then it all, this tool also allows you to pick. So let's say, <clears throat> you have found that you can buy seed from this particular zone here um, from uh, somebody uh, that you've located, you can buy seed from them. You might wanna look specifically at how good is the match between your focal area and the zone where you might get some seed from. And so that this allows you to do that. And then this part of the figure or this part of the table then shows you a direct comparison of just these two zones. And so I'm just gonna zoom in on that a little bit. And so here's our focal zone. Perhaps we have a planting site here. Here's uh, another zone that we might be um, have some available seed. And then we can look. These are different climate variables, such as um, uh, extreme minimum temperature. We have uh, extreme maximum temperature, number of frost-free days. And so we can come and we can look at for a particular hypothetical match between planting site and seed lot. We can find out exactly how similar or different those two zones are climatically to make a final decision about whether that is a good um, source of seed for planting there or not. And then finally, I'm going to wrap up by talking about 
how we've integrated those uh, species distributions into the zone matcher web application. So this information is not presented graphically in, in, the, um, in the tool we developed, but it's presented in a tabular form. And so here, what we've shown, these, this uh, very um, uh, beautiful looking figure here has, um, shows all the zones within this particular area identified with a different color. So these are zones represented by geographic area and elevation. These are Oregon, Washington, 1966 zones. Um, and so this shows the zones, and then this shows overlaid on top of that, the uh, species projection for Douglas fir for the same time period. Um, well, for the current time period. So this is the, the distribution for the period of about 1981 to 2010. And then if we, we can look down, we can overlay a, a species distribution in, for the future. So this is a particular climate scenario, a future year, for example. And we can see again, how the projected distribution of Douglas fir has changed. And so by combining the seed zone climate matching and these species distributions, we can provide a little more information that would be helpful for um, selecting the correct seed lots to plant once, once a species is chosen. So for example, we may find areas where there's a good climate match, but the species are not projected to be, uh, to occur there in the future, presumably for some other reason um, and then that can be accounted for in terms of choosing um, a particular zone um, that would be a good match for um, obtaining seed from. And so then finally, I'm gonna wrap up by um, just kind of leaving this here. This is uh, the number of people that were involved in developing the seed lot selection tool and species potential habitat tool, um, members of the Pacific Northwest Tree Improvement Research Cooperative that provided guidance on the development of the zone matcher um, the people that were involved in developing the zone matcher web application, um, most prominently Meredith McClure, who is a master's student of mine who will be um, finishing her master's degree in June, and then various sources of funding um, for that work. Okay, so that about wraps it up, Glenn. I have um, uh, the other slides after this in terms of future um, Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Just let me know how you want to handle that. Sure. I'll, I'll cue you in on that. Um, wow. Well, I have a lot of questions myself, but uh, let's go through. We've got several more here and we'll, we'll keep going. Um, uh, here's one kind of quick idea, you know, might species suitability work in our favor when it comes to invasive species? Maybe that the climate makes it inhospitable. Uh, that's just maybe an observation, but is that something that scientists are thinking of too? Is it, what about the uh, undesirable species? Well, you know, um, I guess it's possible. You know, most, you know, most of what I read about invasive species that most, you know, very successful invasive species have a, a suite of characteristics that make them invasive in their new environment that go beyond climate. So it might be, for example, ability to fix nitrogen. It might be the absence of other insect and disease pests that normally. Um, you know, influence that invasive species. Um, uh, I'm, I'm thinking about exotic native species now, um, you know, in their, in their home environment, um, ability to vegetatively propagate. So um, to me, it, this doesn't necessarily give me a whole lot of comfort that we can avoid problems with invasive species in the future. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I'm afraid a lot of what I hear of concerns is that it makes invasive species worse, but uh, let's hope not. Um, if projections show loss of habitat for even ponderosa pine with climate change, uh, what else is there that can exist at the hotter and drier sites? Um, you know, will we even have forests in those areas? Um, probably not in some cases. <clears throat> yeah, so, so the, the kind of results that we see, again, are not precise, but they, by looking at these results over and over again, it's not very encouraging for the health of the forests um, in the future. Um, in particular, uh, one of the things that I like to comment on when some people, uh, when they think about assisted migration, um, you know, it's, it's a little bit of a solution perhaps for your lands or for certain areas, but it's, it's not really um, a very broad solution because if we think about how many um, acres or hectares are able to be reforested, reforested each year, um, 
you know, it's only a minute part of the landscape. So um, this kind of uh, system migration or finding species that match particular areas is a, is, um, is, is a solution in specific cases, but not a broad brush solution for maintaining forest health. Yeah, and there's related questions about the more, you know, the complexity of the forest that we might establish. And I mean, I guess I'd throw in a question of how would you even decide on the mix if you were going to start planning assisted migration using these tools, which is something obviously we're, we're just starting to, to think about, you know, how would you maintain some diversity or hedge your bets or mix uh, gene, you know, genetic types of Douglas fir, for example, because a lot of areas still suitable for Douglas fir in general, but we know that the genetics of the Douglas fir, the seed source is gonna really make a big difference in those zones. And so how do you diversify a local population uh, and then also maybe think about mixing species? Um, in a plan. Yeah, so, so I, I haven't, you know, we really haven't uh, thought a lot about the mixing species at this point, because that is really challenging. Um, you know, right now, um, it's been my feeling for the past few years that there's many people interested in practicing assisted migration um, that did not have the um, information needed to do so. But these are mostly people that I'm thinking about that are, you know, establishing plan, plantations of Douglas fir, you know, um, single species plantations of Douglas fir or Western Henlock or, or maybe Ponderosa pine or in other areas, you know, be um, in the inland, it would be other kinds of species. Um, uh, so even getting to that stage, you know, making decisions about planting a single species is, 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 is fairly daunting in itself. So um, I'm not sure I'm able to address the um, mix of species or communities at this point. The other point that was raised there was about um, hedging your bets. And certainly that has been talked about as a strategy um, in terms of let's mix various uh, seed from Douglas fir populations that come from different areas to kind of hedge our bets in case we cannot project exactly what's going to happen, which we can't. Um, the one thing to realize though is however, probably um, in contrast to popular perception is that you know, natural populations of Douglas fir trees and, and, and other species, you know, have a large amount of, of, um, of genetic diversity within them. And so we talk about differences um, from different seed lots, um, from different areas, um, but we're mostly thinking about mean responses, but those, those distributions of genotypes overlap quite a bit from population to population. And so um, if you're dealing with uh, natural populations and the diversity of natural populations, you're probably in reasonably uh, in a reasonably good place if you don't hit, you know, the target exactly. Um, but if you are using much narrower genetic bases, then the, uh, the idea of how to uh, mix things and hedge your bets probably becomes a little more important. Then again, you can also think, do you hedge your bets on a, on a uh, acre by acre basis, or do you uh, hedge your bets by planting different, um, you know, areas to different kinds of uh, materials? Yeah, and, and that's sort of related to another question that came up. Um, you know, diversity or planting diverse forests with a mix uh, or maintaining um, diversity sometimes is seen as a, uh, a resilience, a strategy to maintain resilience that, uh, you know, having more than one species or having a, a diverse mix, uh, you know, would provide some, um, you know, adaptability, let's say. And that was one person's observation, you know, would we expect rather than monocultures, would, you know, would other uh, more diverse forest communities expect to be more robust or resilient. Um, and of course, then economics might come in there for your different kinds yeah, of forest yes. so th That's another point which I didn't mention here, but it bears mentioning now, is that um, certainly, you know, more diverse forests, um, both, you know, species diversity and within species diversity um, would uh, be expected to provide greater resilience and greater buffering of climate change, but that will probably come at the cost of perhaps what other, other ecosystem services you want to get from there, including, you know, timber and, and the economic kind of ecosystem services that you derive from that. So people have different objectives and also people have different risk tolerances. And so one of the kind of the driving uh, concepts in terms of developing these tools was to provide sufficient information to people that they can tailor that information to their particular objectives and their, to their particular risk, um, you, know, um, you know, whether they're risk averse or not. 
Um, so that was, you know, rather than trying to provide specific answers, give people information that they can tailor it to their specific conditions. I am wondering if we may have lost Glenn here, um, Glenn Ahrens. He doesn't seem to be moving. Um, so um, for the, I guess, let me turn my camera back on. Um, until Glenn, yeah, it looks like we lost Glenn Ahrens, our, our main host today. Um, so um, we were just asking some questions here right now. So I'm going to just go ahead and continue to ask a couple of questions, Glenn, if, uh, if that's okay with you. That's good. I feel like you lost me for a moment there, but um, I'm, I'm glad it was uh, <laughs> doing and not me. Great. Okay. So, um, hi, everybody. My name is Dan Stark. I'm an extension forester. And um, I just wanted to, here's another question. Um, uh, does the seed selection website you referred um, or you referenced consider altitude? So um, they have some land in Colorado and notice some species grow to specific altitudes naturally, but others has, have also started to grow at even higher altitudes in recent years. Okay, so um, I can address that. So another piece of information that I didn't include in there was um, you know, where the climate information so comes from. So each of these tools, um, the species potential habitat tool, the sea life selection tool and the zone matcher are all based on um, climate, um, you know, inferred climate across the landscape, both currently and into the future. So where does that climate information come from? Um, we have uh, focused our analyses on a um, climate interpolation program called Climate North America, which was developed by Tong Lee Wang at the University of British Columbia. Um, and so that, that particular climate interpolation program is based on uh, PRISM data. Um, and so those climate, those inferred climates are based on such things as latitude, longitude, elevation, topography, uh, distance from the ocean, et cetera. So it incorporates um, altitude, I guess, in the way um, it incorporates altitude through those the effect of uh, altitude on climate. Okay, looks like I'm back. Sorry about that. Um, and then a couple other questions. I don't know if you picked up on these. Uh, in the Q&A, but um, does the seed lot selection tool uh, consider altitude? And I think that's clear that it does. Uh, that's part of what it's mapping there uh, in, in the climate right. projections. Yeah. Um, and then another one was um, someone referenced a tool they saw that would project the climate in a certain location. Uh, and where could you see the same climate um, elsewhere? And, and again, that Seed lot selection tool does that. You can just map the current climate for an area based on variables. I think a key question for me is how do you pick the climate variables? Uh, you said there are some guidance in the tool. Yeah. I mean, you, you used annual precipitation and temperature, but how do you pick some of these other ones like minimum or maximum or other? Yeah, so I, I can address it. Let me just drop back to the altitude thing. And this is kind of a general comment too in relation to um, habitats. So, um, the, you know, the climate data that we're using incorporates the effect of altitude on climate, but it doesn't incorporate you know, other effects of altitude that are separate from climate. So this always needs to be remembered. So for example, if you go to Colorado, high altitudes, um, you know, solar radiation can be a big issue. And there's certain um, uh, genotypes of trees that are well adapted to the high elevation uh, high solar energy at some of those very high elevations and other ones that would not be. Um, so we always have to remember that it's, um, we're looking at a certain uh, cross section of habitat and not the full habitat um, that we would really like to, um, to look at. Um, okay, so then your other question was what, I just wanted to clarify that. Then your other question was what again, Glenn? Oh, it was, um, how would you pick the, the climate variables? Okay, the climate uh, variables, right. So we have guidance from you know, research that has been done. Um, and so the climate variables that are, are typically thought of as being most valuable um, uh, might be mean annual, uh, mean annual temperature, mean annual precipitation. So certain people use those two variables alone. Uh, 
Um, if you look at a larger suite of variables, you know, and again, this, re this relates to this part of the country, particularly Oregon and Washington, um, we can think about um, summer precipitation, um, mean uh, uh, winter minimum temperatures, and there's a couple different variables you could use to reflect winter minimum temperatures, uh, summer precipitation, perhaps uh, summer maximum temperatures. Um, because we have dry summers here, the, 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 the temperatures and precipitation in the summer are important and the minimum, 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 temp minimum, minimum temperatures are among the most important in uh, defining um, population level genetic variation, for example. Um, the way that CLAP selection tool works, it's, um, it's good to focus on a, you know, maybe up to four variables. It becomes a little bit very restrictive if you incorporate too many climate variables. The zone matcher uses a slightly more sophisticated approach for matching climates that, that would be the one that I would actually prefer to use, um, which it uses a larger suite of climate variables in a, in a kind of a balanced way. Very good. Well, we're at 4.30 and I just wanted, if you could put the, uh information about the upcoming webinars up. And um, I've also have launched a little end wrap up poll here just to see what folks thought about the, the material today and the presentation and um, just uh, enter that input at your leisure. Um, and then uh, if you would go ahead and advance to the upcoming um, webinars there, Glenn. Okay. Let's see if I can uh, do that here. Always find I have to wake up the PowerPoint after. Yeah. Um, there you go. Okay, there's there's my name and contact, and here's one of the um, upcoming webinars. All right. So we have uh, on the east side the managing eastern forest webinars are are still going, and uh, logical pine is the focus uh, next week. Um, and is there another one? Uh, and our Wildfire Wednesdays, uh, next one is April 28th, uh, fire aware and fire prepared, uh, looking at uh, ready, set, go, and preparing for evacuation. And we also have one focused on slash burning uh, on, on May 4th, uh, best, you know, how to manage your slash files. Uh, so with, with that, um, I'm gonna go ahead and we're going into overtime now. So uh, thank you all for coming and, and providing a little input. And I hope you found this uh, interesting. Of course, for me, it's just raised as many questions as answers, uh, but it gives me some tools to look at this, this question of, of climate change and matching species and, and gene genotypes. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and close the, the wrap up poll here. Thank you for that. And so we're in overtime and there's still a some folks here, uh, but I don't see any more questions. Um, so we might give folks a little bit of time. I guess I, I'd ask you a general question. Glenn, right? Glenn to, sorry to interrupt. There are a couple questions in the chat box. Um, so I, I had messaged you that you, if you, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I just wanted to, um, maybe after your question, you can get to those too. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I didn't, I saw the one that we asked. So let me look here. Um, okay. Um, well, make sure that, the, yes, the, in the resources, we'll have links to all the tools. Um, I'm not really seeing questions in the chat box. Um, there was a question that was um, pertaining to, um, you know, advising um, using um, diverse forest communities rather than monocultures. And uh, forgive me if you already addressed this. Um, for these, for these, um, for these forest owners, are the communities expected to be more robust or less robust? How will their economic projections? You know, what will happen with their? What, can you can you say something on their economic projections? Okay. Yeah, yeah, we were talking about that. I just kind of paraphrase that, but okay, um, I'm sorry. Yeah, but I didn't. We didn't get too deep into the economic side of it. Okay, I see another question. Um, oh, is is the webinar pre-approved for uh, ISC Arbor CEUs? No, it is not. Um, okay, so I guess the question I thought of before we wrap up is. Um, in terms of the species distribution, the models of, you know, here's the kind of climate Doug Fur lives in now, and 
how do we shift that? I've seen different versions of that. There's multiple versions of species distribution models. And has there been any look at trying to compare those? Because there's some very different answers depending on whose model you look at. Um, so how would a person decide which one to use? Is there any kind of critique or comparison and, and maybe a rating of which one's, you know, uh, scientific consensus uh, about those distribution models? Yeah, so that's a, it's a little bit of a tough one. Tough one. I mean, so certainly um, if, if someone is uh, involved in this area of, of research and that, and that kind of a thing, you know, there's certain things that, that I would look at to determine whether I, I how well, well I trust this particular species distribution or not. Um, but I can't enumerate all those now. There, there um, has been not enough, I think, you know, um, what we call ensemble uh, species distributions, which would incorporate um, information from different approaches. Um, and that is something that we, you know, we had uh, wanted to do a number of years ago, but it's a little bit challenging. Um, in particular, one of the major challenges among the different models is the use of different climate data, um, different kinds of uh, input data, um, which automatically then, you know, can lead to differences among those. So, um, it's an untapped area for further, um, you know, further investigation. And so, for example, if we, um, you know, if we had the ability, it would be nice to include models um, using different approaches in the species potential habitat tool, for example. So that's a very astute point, but I don't know if we have a good, um, a good immediate solution to that. Yeah, I just found it a little bit puzzling when I look at the different uh, published uh, tools and then they come up with very different answers. And so uh, I would naturally tend to work with yours because I'm familiar with it and I have some basic understanding of how it's put together. Uh, well, very good. I don't see any new questions. Dan, is there anything else? Yeah, anything? I didn't see anything um, else coming in on the Q&A box there. Well, I just, I guess I'll just thank you, Glenn, for joining us. And uh, I, I learned a lot here, even though I've, I've tried to figure this stuff out in the past. I followed what you've been doing. The first time I looked at this tool was in 2007 when you were starting it. So it's amazing to think of how long um, we've been working on this, but it's certainly getting um, better and easier for me to understand. But a lot of work to do yet to figure out what to do on the ground. Thank you, Glenn. Okay. Thanks. For, thanks for the opportunity to speak on the topic. All right. You're welcome. And goodbye, everybody. Till next time.